Our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Andrea Romo. Uh, Andrea received her PhD in history from Freie Universität Berlin this year. Congratulations. The core subject of her research is analyzing the circumstances in which police deviance occurred in Ecuador after the de uh, democratic transition, uh, 1979 2010, as well as the factors uh, influencing this behavior. Uh, the study also examines the, dis the distinct strategies employed by female offenders to resist uh, victimization by the police. She has published in journals such as uh, Feminist Criminology, Police Practice and Research, and Policing in Society, forthcoming. She is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Her research interests include the levels and causes of violence and criminality in Latin America, perceptions of procedural justice among female offenders, police misconduct, and the intersectional experiences of minority female offenders with the criminal justice system in the region and mainly in Ecuador. Uh, the title of her uh, presentation today is We Colombian Women Are Damned No Matter What We Do. Police officers' perceptions and Colombian refugee women experiences during the arrest in Ecuador. Thank you very much, uh, Lior, liar, Lior, Lior Ben, <laughs> the, for the presentation. Also, thank you very much, Stefan and Ranan, for the invitation. And it is also a pleasure to be sharing with you this panel today, Ari. So, as you can see, this is the title of my presentation today. I'm not going to repeat it because you already said it. And uh, well, basically, I will start with uh, presenting one of my interviewees' testimony. She's a Colombian woman uh, who had submitted an application for refugee status by the time she was arrested for murder. So I interviewed this woman in, back in 2015. And well, I will not be talking specifically about human smuggling, uh, as Ari mentioned. I will be talking about the discrimination that uh, these Colombian women, intersectional discrimination that Colombian women face in uh, Ecuadorian territory, which are women basically that are very much uh, vulnerable to any sort of uh, violent behavior, including human smuggling, of course. So before starting, as I said, I will be showing you uh, one oral testimony. I was planning to show you a video, but since everybody it's a broadcast in video and online, it's not possible for me to show you the face of the person. So you will only hear her testimony. And by the way, it's in Spanish, but I was told that everybody will be able to understand. Okay. Yo soy detenida por asesinato, uh -huh. eh, fui detenida en el 2009, fue la muerte de mi compañía, eh, del novio de mi compañera, yo compartí apartamento con una chica colombiana también y el novio fue asesinado, cuando eso de las 10 de la mañana más o menos llegaron los agentes, dos agentes del GAO, llegaron eh, de civiles en un carro particular sin placas de ningún, eh, oficiales para nada, eh, sin ninguna orden, preguntando por las dos, porque fuimos las dos últimas personas supuestamente que lo vimos con vida. Entonces nos dijeron que si lo podíamos acompañar hasta las oficinas para, para hacer la declaración, una, una versión libre de los hechos, y nosotros accedimos y no hay ningún problema. O sea, la verdad es que para mí por aquí, de lo que se venía encima, o sea, ni por aquí. Ya nos montaron en el carro, en el momento que nos montaron en el carro fue el suplicio. Ahí empezó todo. Y de hecho, nos, nos trataron de culpables en ese mismo instante, o sea, dos agentes del lado que no tenían ni idea quiénes éramos, que no tenían ni idea, eh, no habían hecho ninguna investigación pertinente para dar una conjetura como esa, nos dijeron desde ese momento, ustedes fueron los que los mataron, ustedes son un par de asesinas, eh, colombianas tales y cuales, hijas de tales y cuales, que vienen a mi país a hacer esto y esto y esto. A ver, en el carro duramos más o menos un transcurso de media hora, hasta que nos llevaron a una casa y a Carolina la ponen en una habitación y me ponen en otra y yo escucho cómo la están golpeando me estaban interrogando y ya luego como que cambiaba porque ya dejaba de escucharla a ella y, y empezaban a golpearme, a golpearme a mí pero era súper gracioso porque solamente me golpeaban de aquí para abajo o sea la cara no me la tocaban jamás jamás me tocaron la cara pero el cuerpo era lleno de moretones o sea mis costillas no servían para nada yo a mí me dolía hasta respirar y 
me metía en la cabeza en, en, una, en un baldecito con Coca-Cola. O sea, era, fue terrible. O sea, y fue desde las 11 de la mañana más o menos que llegamos a esa casa, bueno, tipo mediodía más o menos que llegamos a esa casa, hasta casi las 10 de la noche, cuando a esa hora nos dijeron que el juez iba a emitir la orden de captura a nosotros. O sea, nosotros estuvimos casi, casi 12 horas detenidas y siendo maltratadas físicamente y psicológicamente sin una orden pertinente, o sea, detenidas ilegalmente. O sea, el hecho de yo enfatizarles que yo sabía mis derechos porque yo era una abogada y que yo eh, contaba con mi título profesional y litigaba y ejercía en mi país, eh, eh, fue, eh, era motivo de, de burla para ellos. O sea, eh, simplemente lo tomaban como broma y como que sí, la doctorcita que viene a, a putear, porque esos eran los, los términos que, que, que utilizaban, que vienen a trabajar en un chongo y a matar a, a, a cual pelagato que se les atraviese y como términos así, o sea, simplemente el, el hecho de mi educación fue irrelevante para ellos, o sea, era, era un motivo más para, para que fuera objeto de su burla, o sea, era, por eso llegó un momento en que yo dejé de decir que era abogada, porque sentía que me iba mejor cuando me quedaba callada, simplemente por el hecho de ser mujeres, eh, ya tenemos el, como yo decía anteriormente, ya la marquilla, ¿no? De que somos prostitutas mientras que el hombre colombiano tiene el, 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 la marquilla de ser sicario ¿no? entonces simplemente por el hecho de ser colombiano sicario les da, aunque, aunque sea por temor pero mantienen un poco el, la distancia ¿no? no sé si fue por mi tendencia sexual que eh, ¿Tú enfatizaste eso también sí, durante la detención? Sí, sí, obviamente. ¿Por, ¿Por qué lo hiciste? ¿Por qué lo creíste necesario? Porque eh, en el momento que decían que era prostituta y que cuando supuestamente eh, por, eh, nos excedimos con un cliente, porque eso fue lo que dijeron al principio, yo enfatizaba, es que yo soy lesbiana, yo no soy prostituta, a mí no me gustan los hombres, ¿cómo me voy a propasar con un cliente si es que yo no me dedico a eso? A mí no me gustan los hombres. Entonces, eh, es, les daba un poco de... Hasta podría decirle en ese momento que, que ellos eh, en, con sus expresiones eh, mostraban con un poco de asco ¿no? por mi tendencia sexual. Mientras que con mi compañera no, o sea, mi compañera eh, sí fue manoseada, no fue violada para nada, pero sí fue acosada, fue acosada sexualmente por ellos. Ok, um, I guess that it's a little bit strong what she had to say about the police in Ecuador and uh, well... Um, we will see later that this is not the only case of a Colombian woman, a person who is an asylum seeker or a refugee uh, in Ecuador that is a victim of such behavior or mistreatment by the police. So uh, I will come back to Lily's testimony later on during this presentation, but first I would like to explain briefly some of the, uh, this paper's background or context. So, as you may know, there are several factors that influence or that have influenced the migration or the increase in migration of Colombians to Ecuador. Uh, so, Ecuador has started to attract a significant number of Colombian refugees and immigrants as early as the 1950s. Many left Colombia for economic reasons. We can elaborate more on that later. And of course, there is also the factor of the geographic proximity of the two countries. But one of the most important factors influencing these citizens' migration was the armed conflict, or is the, well, let's say ongoing or not so much, conflict that have lasted more than 50 years in the country. Especially it is after the implementation of Plan Colombia and Plan Patriota uh, that violence intensified in the northern and southern regions of the country. So human rights violations and the general violence resulting from those two, uh, the implementation of those two plans resulting in thousands of Colombian citizens fleeing the country in search of international protection. As a result, some sources have pointed out that by 2004, there were, when Plan Patriota started or was launched, there were 300,000 official and non-official Colombians dispersed throughout Ecuador. So let's take a look at census data. Each decade, as you can see, the Colombian cities represented half of the foreign population in Ecuador. 
In fact, uh, the Colombian population increased by 64% between the its census of 2001 and the census of 2010. Also, for those of you who might not know this, uh, Ecuador hosts the largest refugee population in Latin America, of whom the majority were and continue to be Colombians. We can see here that um, according to sources of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, between January 1989 and February 2019, it is precisely Colombia that leads the list of those uh, who are refugees in Ecuador. There are also, of course, other countries from within the region and also other countries from um, the Middle East. With regard to the uh, applicants for refugee status, it is also possible to see that Colombia leads the list and in the second position it is now Venezuela. Now, uh, what is interesting about this is that Venezuela did not used to be on the top countries that uh, with persons of, as applicants for refugee status in Ecuador until a few years ago. But due to the current humanitarian crisis in the country, uh, there are over 300,000 Venezuelans now in Ecuadorian territory as well. So probably they are also affected by the situation that has been affecting Colombians for a long time. So especially since 2007, the increasing presence of Colombian refugees in urban areas and not only in the borderlands, and it used to be in the past few years um, at the beginning basically Colombian state at the border cities, and they didn't, didn't really go to the main cities of the country, Quito and Guayaquil. So uh, by, they, by the time that they decided to enter Quito and Guayaquil and other big cities of the country, this created social tensions or social distress. In fact, more than 50% of Colombians refugees and asylum seekers were living in the two most populated provinces and urban centers of the country, between Chanwayas by 2010. So with increasing visibility of Colombians in big cities, the media and the political discourse began to strongly associate their presence with increasing levels of crime and insecurity in the country. This situation affected public perceptions regarding the arrival of those Colombians seeking refuge. The Ecuadorian media has frequently portrayed Colombian male refugees as, and some immigrants also of Colombian region as the leaders of criminal organizations engaged in drug crimes, money laundering, and higher killings. While Colombian women have often been associated with sex work and crimes related to that pro profession. I don't know if you have heard of Dulce Sueños, for example. I don't know, maybe in Colombia or in other countries, you also have that uh, type of crime, you know, that which is conducted by, usually by women. So several media and political prejudices are rooted in the imaginary of many Ecuadorians, including law enforcement si officials since then. Now, I'm not going to go uh, over the details of uh, the media and the political discourse that have affected Colombian immigrants and Colombian refugees, but it is important to highlight here that um, this seriously contributed to the circulation of several stereotypes, negative stereotypes and negative uh, generalizations about this population in the country. And of course, these stereotypes have affected men and Colombian men and women differently. Now, I'm going to present some of the, these research results. I think it's, there's no need to explain about the research questions, but those are the ones that I use for this particular paper. And uh, uh, before continuing with uh, the presentation of results, it is important to tell you that this was, these results that I'm presenting today are part of a larger project where I worked with uh, 51 interviewees, female inmates, in, uh, who were interviewed in the three most populated prisons of the country. I also worked with 50 in-depth interviews with police officers and more than 5,000 female prisoner files and also uh, court documents produced since the 1980. So among all the women interviewed, Colombian refugees and immigrants stood out due to the fact that they 
always reported negative interactions with police officers. There were no exceptions. There were other minority groups which I, uh, that I work with as well, but they, those of, some of these women also had positive experiences with the police, but Colombians never had a positive experience. So their marginalized position in society made them suitable targets for different police deviant actions. Their nationality, as well as other social identities, such as gender, class, age, and sexual orientation, shaped their experiences with the police. Out of 51 female offenders in the sample, all Colombian interviewees experienced at least one form of police deviant actions, ranging from police sexual misconduct, torture, discrimination, extortion, and many more. They were abused verbally, physically, and psychologically, and all were affected by the irregularities which occurred while they were in custody. So Lily's testimony demonstrates that the intersecting gender and nationality stereotypes shade the profile of Colombian male and female offenders differently. For example, Colombian men are associated, as I said before, with drug offenses and higher killings, while women are associated with sex work. The automatic association of Colombian women with prostitution puts them in a more vulnerable social location where they were more likely to experience police sexual misconduct and other forms of gender-based violence. So Lily remembers that after the arrest, she and her Colombian flatmate, she mentioned her, uh, Carolina, were frequently called prostitutes. And because of the fact that police officers associated them with that profession, they felt empowered to make unwanted sexual advances to her flatmate. In response to this situation, Lily decided to confess that she was not a prostitute, that she could not be a prostitute in her mind because she was a homosexual woman. So it is clear that although the policemen seemed to disapprove her sexual orientation, making that confession allowed her to avoid being sexually harassed by them. So in that particular context, uh, being a homosexual woman served as a self-preservation mechanism. So she protected herself by doing that. She didn't know that that was going to work in her advantage. She still felt discriminated against because she said that she was a lesbian and evidently the police officers did not took it good. But in any, in nevertheless, she avoided being sexually harassed by police officers. So, as I said before, her flatmate did not have the same luck since the intersection of her gender and nationality, uh, which made the police officers to conclude that she was a prostitute, placed her in a position where she experienced police sexual misconduct. So, after the arrest, Lily believed her legal knowledge was going to work in her advantage. She said that she was a lawyer, she knew her human rights, she knew the procedural guidelines police officers were supposed to follow, and she mentioned those things to police officers when they were trying to uh, harass her and when they were torturing her. But in this case, the opposite occurred, which is very interesting because working with other minority groups, when all the other minority women, or not minorities, uh, told the police officers that they knew their rights, police officers automatically stopped because they knew that they could have problems. But th th this didn't happen with the Colombian women. So although her level of educational attainment could have worked in her favor, in her case, her sex and nationality were more significant for police officers who did not stop associating her with prostitution and of blaming her for a contract killing. In response to the extra mistreatment from police officers linked to her education, she protected herself by keeping quiet. So there were other women, um, also Colombians of course, that uh, reported similar experiences in my study. As I said, not only the women that I had the opportunity to interview, but those of those cases that I had the opportunity to read in the archives as well. So um, the first case is of Fanny, who was arrested in 1987. And the second case is of Alexandra, who was arrested in 2010. All of these experiences are somehow different, but show similar patterns. What is interesting or is important to understand is that each case 
is unique because each women have different identities, of course. So what the police officer said about all this, because as I said, I work with 50 police officers, of, out of whom only 30, I mean, basically 39 of them, the visible majority, showed or expressed uh, prejudice attitudes or comments about Colombian citizens. I'm going to finish. So um, let's see what uh, Willie had to say. He became a police officer in 1996. He said, when the borders are open, but people will always enter. People who are running from their own country. Of the 100% of all Colombians in the country, perhaps just one is good. Francisco, on the other hand, said, most Colombian women who come to our country engage in prostitution. And there were several other opinions and comments about Colombian immigrants, um, asylum seekers, and refugees in general. So now I will briefly mention some conclusions, and then we can open, I think, the Q&A session. So first, even when uh, many of female offenders interviewed were affected by several forms of police deviance, they did not passively accept their victimization. Instead, they employed, employed different tactics, different strategies to enhance their situation in custody or when they were arrested. So you would be surprised really by the things some of these women did or said to police officers in order to avoid further victimization. Second, there is a relationship between police officers' perception of these women and the treatment that women received uh, during their interactions with police officers. Police officers participants verbally expressed the negative stereotypes they associated with this minority group. And those officers who arrested the women, according to women's testimonies and of course their experiences, also expressed their stereotype views and perceptions through their deviant and discriminatory attitudes and acts against them. The dissemination of negative stereotypes related to these and other minority groups by the media and the government discourse facilitated the victimization of these individuals in the hands of the police and also of the general population. Thank you.